morning, folks. I hope you're well. Cheers. Number 27 once again. This time in the rosebud. Let's see what it's like in the rosebud. I've done quite a lot of these rosebuds uh, now, and uh, I've had quite a few commissions for rosebuds. But interestingly, the commissions have always been for larger ones. <coughs> the original here, this is the first one, and it's quite a lot smaller. Um, it's a it's a real sort of take with you anywhere kind of pipe. It's really small and lightweight. I'm thinking of um, redoing the stem on it. It's a, this one is a molded stem. So I'm thinking of doing my own one in uh, my favorite material. And this stuff. Truth be told, um, I always get a bit nervous when I'm doing smaller pipes, which are um, sort of shaped like this, where it goes in. I always get nervous about burnout there. So in a way, I'm quite relieved that people tend to order the larger ones. Although the walls are thick enough, even at the thinnest point, it's going to be probably thicker than the average downhill, for instance. Downhills, the walls are relatively, I wouldn't say thin, but they're a standard size. I would say they're about. Where's my micrometer? It's not an easy to replace, it's probably right in front of my eyes. I would say that the average downhill is probably between five and six mil in thickness, at least at the rim. It probably gets a bit bigger as it goes down, depending on the shape. So if it's a, um, certainly an apple shape is gonna get wider. But even a billiard shape will have a little bit of a bulge. So the actual, where it matters, you know, from the center of the ball, from maybe the first third down, um, it's gonna be thicker than that. It's really very much about your experience uh, in pipe smoking. You know, if you're when you break in a pipe, you know what you're doing, and you build up the cake in a sort of a, sort of a steady pace without overdoing it. Then you know, even a thinner. I've had downhill pipes, vintage downhill pipes, which were even thinner. There, you're talking about you know four mil, something like that. Really, really thin. Um, I remember I bought one, a vintage one from the Danish pipe shop. One of my first, I think it was my first, my very first downhill. I've since had the uh, retail, I bought, um, I had a stubby Dublin, beautiful pipe, um, but I just didn't smoke it and I ended up selling it. Um, very, very nice. It was, a. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the range now, but the brown, is it, what was it called? It wasn't the Cumberland, I don't think. It was a uh, brown sandblast with a, a Cumberland stem, but I don't recall. It was nine mil as well. It wasn't converted or anything. It was an original nine mil, and it was a very nice pipe. It was just the, the, because it was stubby for some reason. 
it just didn't sit well with me i don't know why maybe the balance of it was a bit off i don't know because it was a sort of a stubby shank and stem but the bowl was a standard sized bowl so maybe it was too bowl heavy I, I don't know i don't remember but the draw on that pipe was the best draw i've experienced in any of the pipes that i bought velvety smooth draw kudos to them for that for sure the sandblast was really nice the finishing was nice it was a beautiful pipe it really was it didn't work for me but it was i have to say that you know people argue about whether dunhills are worth the money and whether you're just paying for the hype and the brand well, which you are but still they're very well made pipes very very well made pipes I, I mean, I, I haven't had loads of retail done. I haven't bought them, you know, loads of retail uh, done. I've only bought the one. Any Someone others that I've had, door. any others that I've had would have been bought, um, would have been estate pipes. I need to make sure somebody gets that. Where was I? Um, yeah, so Dunhill pipes. The, the ones that I've had in my hand have always been very good. And yes, you're paying, it's a luxury band, it's a luxury item, you know, you can argue about whether it's, there's intrinsic increase in value, but it's not, you're paying for the consistency of quality, I think. And that it's a famous brand, you have to pay for those kind of things. You could argue whether an Omega is better than a Seiko, and I'm sure there's plenty uh, small brands, boutique brands, who make watches that may be better than Omega, but they don't have the branding, they're not as famous, and that's just the way it is. That's called uh, lifestyle. You're paying for the lifestyle. It's a lifestyle choice. And you can argue about it till you, the cows come home as to the value, the intrinsic value. It means nothing. I mean, the Rolexes which people pay for, most of it is just hype and branding. You know, again, their quality control is very good compared to a lot of other watches, um, and they've presumably earned their reputation. It's just the way it goes. A lot of them, a lot of it is legacy reputation. Dunhill, for instance, Dunhill pipes probably earned their reputation during the war, and it built up from there. There's famous pictures of uh, Alfred Dunnell during the Second World War in the Blitz, where the shop had been bombed, and he was outside. He had taken his desk outside, and he was on the street selling pipes, taking in repairs, and so on. And it was that kind of um, sort of spirit that people might call it British stiff upper lip and all that kind of thing, but um, it was his dogged tenacity that he said, no, we're opening for business. Um, and it's that kind of thing, the fact that they sent pipes all over the world during the war. Um, uh, you know, and, and if the pipes that they sent out, and let's say some kind of general who was fighting somewhere, I don't know, maybe in the, I don't know if it was as far back as the Boer War, but certainly in the Second World War, maybe the First World War, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, probably the Second World War. Um, it could have been the First World War as well, possibly. I'm not sure of the dates. But certainly they sent out to a lot of the, the officers, um, I believe they sent out uh, pipes, and wherever they were in the world. So when that officer was going to come back, number one, he was going to talk about them to his friends in the mess, and, uh, but he was going to come back and be a customer. And uh, they built their reputation around that time. And, uh, you know, when you pay now 500 pounds for a Dunhill, you're paying for what was invested back then by Alfred Dunhill in terms of effort and time and money. You can't buy a reputation. You can't buy good standing. You have to earn that. And it's why even if I look at myself, if I'm introspective and I say, I look at myself and, <coughs> excuse me, any new pipe maker, no matter how new or how old, but any relatively new pipe maker, 
is always going to struggle with pricing. I've mentioned this before. Pricing is one of the hardest things in, in pipe making. You might make a pipe, a stunning pipe. I'm currently working on a pipe which I think is an absolutely beautiful pipe. I think it's going to be amazing by the time it's finished. It's a very similar pipe to the one I made yesterday, but it's um, I think just going to be a step above. So it's the same features, but it's got my favorite stem material, horn, gadet. Um, but this this time it's just a, it's a bent billiard, the same flared um, shank, but just maybe slightly better grain. I'm not sure. We'll see in the final uh, when it's done whether it's better or not. But um, this pipe will likely sell for around between 275 and 300 depending on the quality of the grain that kind of region give or take um, to me you know I might think it's worth 500 but it makes no blind bit of difference what I think it's what it's going to sell for it's market force um, and it's you know it's it's as they say beauty is in, in the eye of the beholder but it, you've got to invest the time so every single time I sell a pipe which I think is underpriced for me, that's an investment in the future. I've got to build my reputation. I've got to build my standing in the pipe community. And that takes time. And that takes consistency more than anything else. People have to see consistently good pipes being made. Um, and uh, so years down the line, hopefully when I will be able to charge whatever the, that figure might be in, the, in those days to come, um, it'll be based on the investment that I'm giving now I'm giving you know the quality control, the consistency, the quality of grain, the quality of stems, um, and the design. You know my particular design language, which obviously there's an audience for. Every pipe maker out there has their own particular design language, and they'll find their audience. Um, but it's that investment that I'm giving now, where I feel sometimes, not always. I'm, I don't want to be bragging, but there are times when I'll make a pipe and I feel that you know this is worth more than I can get for it. That's an investment. That's an investment in the future. And um, and that you have to go into it realizing that because if you don't, you're going to get very frustrated as a pipe maker. Really, you're going to get very frustrated. Um, on the on the flip side, you see some pipe makers who are charging, you know, a, a price which is beyond what their pipes are worth. Possibly, in, in my opinion, in his opinion, not obviously. In his opinion, he's probably thinking the same thing. My pipes are worth more, but it's not about what he thinks or about my pipes. What I think, it's about what the customer thinks. And ultimately, it's only going to be as good as what you can get for it. And um, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes with some pipes. Um, but it's just your investment. That's how I look at it. That is your investment in the future of your trade. Speaking of which, I'm working on this pipe at the moment. So as I say, the same kind of features. Notched it up a little bit, I think. Nice long saddle there. A little bit more of a pronounced wave on the stem. And I'm just starting to work on the slot now. Um, a little bit, you know, more distinct shaping on the godet here. And the grain is looking really good. So we'll see how that one works out. Again, another nice thick walls. Once again, I'll say if anybody's got some McClellan's number 27, which they're not going to smoke or they're happy to trade, I'm up for that. I'm up for a trade. McClellan's number 27. If you have some, I wouldn't mind getting my hand on some more. I mean, I can live without it. You know, I enjoy OGS, obviously. But it's nice to change up every so often. I think that the smoke is a little bit warmer, a little bit hotter in this pipe because it's a smaller pipe, shorter shank, 
I'm wondering if this maybe suits a slightly longer pipe better. I did not experience that at all yesterday in this pipe. And it's only marginally longer. It's, uh, it's, it's a half an inch, that's all it is, but it makes it seem to have made a difference. I'll need to try it in another pipe. Maybe I'll try it in the, in the Peterson. I have smoked this, the, the first tin in the Peterson. It was very nice. Uh, I need to keep going with that Peterson. I need to get it fully broken in. Anyway, I'm going to continue. As I said, I'm just cutting the slot right now. The slot cutter. It's a, a side file. It's basically got sharp serrated edges on the, on the side. And uh, you just... I have sort of looked into sort of more... Uh, I wouldn't say corner cutting, but time-saving ways of doing this. And one of the ways I tried was with the Dremel with a, a similar kind of bit in the Dremel and then just and it does it in a split second literally but you just don't have the same control and it ends up going a little bit haywire it's okay but it just sometimes it goes as I say a little bit haywire and, it, and it's just not as neat and uh, because I was finding that using doing it by hand as it always is the case takes time but by hand often as always is the case not as often is the case hand done is better so um, I did for a while use the Dremel, but um, for the last, uh, I don't know, the last few months at least I've been using the hand, doing it by hand. It's just, it's a strain on your hand for sure, um, but it just works better. And I would say that even in the beginning when you do this by hand, you also tend to go off a little bit. It just, that's muscle memory. It's like anything. It just needs practice. So if you try it with one of these, um, and you find that you're going a bit haywire, don't worry about it. It just needs practice. Um, it just takes time. Um, you can buy these, what you can actually buy, you can buy this, a long length of this, um, on rawcrafted.com. And what you want to do is get one of these, one of these small little things which you can buy on Amazon, which hold sort of little like uh, Dremel bits and things like that. And you just cut a length of it off. You don't want it to be too long because then it becomes too flexible. And when you're working on it, it'll bend. So you want it to be about two inches sticking out, about two inches sticking out, not more. And then what you do is, is you, when you're cutting, you cut the full length like that. Then you know you're getting a really nice, long, graduated um, triangle in there. And it ends up, it gives you a nice smooth draw. Um, and as long as you haven't got this too long and you, or you haven't got it too short, then you can just rely on the length of it until you hit the, the handle, then you know roughly how long your slot is. Um, but this is actually better, I should really, um, these are too short now because they do break every so often. So this is a little bit short for me, but I'm gonna buy some more of the full length ones. And then um, I might even fashion my own handle, um, something with nice, comfortable um, sort of areas to, to, to grip it with, just to make it a little bit easier to do. Um, you know, the bigger, the thicker the handle, Obviously not too thick, but when you've got something to hold on to, it does tend to make it a little bit easier um, to, to a little bit less strain on your wrist and on your hand and, and on this area here. Daughter's wedding two weeks today. Still doing the final arrangements, still dealing with the florist, still have to sit down with the caterer to finalise the meal, the menu. We're meeting the photographer today, this afternoon. It's all go. So I kind of have to work in between all of these things to try and get pipes done, which is why a lot of the time I end up working very late at night. Most nights I fall asleep in his chair. And I don't get into bed till a lot later. And sometimes I sleep really well in this chair. You know, I just, my head will just drop and that's it. My wife put me, when was it? What's today, Monday? I think it was Thursday night. I'd fallen asleep and 
my wife came in and she saw me sitting at the thing with my hand on the mouse. Yeah, I was busy doing some work on the computer. I had fallen asleep, my hand was still on the mouse. She saw that I was asleep, so she didn't disturb me. Um, I woke up at um, it was early in the evening actually, because I'd obviously been ext extremely tired, and I, I fell asleep. It must have been about four or five in the afternoon, and I woke up at around half past five in the afternoon. But when I woke up, I thought it was 5.30 in the morning and I thought I'd slept the whole night sitting in the chair. I was completely disorientated until I realised that it wasn't, it was the afternoon. And I'd only had a half an hour kit and I thought, oh dang it, a half an hour, that's all. And I thought I'd had a whole night's sleep. When you have one of those nights sleep where it literally goes like that, it's as if it wasn't, as if it didn't happen. Those are the best nights, that means you slept like a flipping rock and like you were dead to the world. Which to some extent you are. Because when you sleep you're comatose, when you're in a proper deep sleep, you are to a certain percentage dead. Pretty much. If you see that you're going off a little bit and you're starting to cut it a little bit at an angle, you can correct it. You just have to keep pressure in the direction that you want to go. Just gentle pressure until it bites into the ebonite in that direction and then you can follow that new direction. You can, you can repair it kind of thing if you start to see that you're going off. You just need to check it every so often, just blow the dust away. And as you're cutting it, it's not going to be the neatest hole. You finish it off with a file, and then you so you flatten out the lines so they're nice and neat. Uh, something like that, a flat file. They're cheap and cheerful to buy. Um, I try to buy slightly better ones if I can. Uh, I have a whole combination of files that I use for different parts of the slot. Um, I use sort of round ones like that. Really, these are jewelers Swiss files. I have them taped with different. Um, color tape so I know which one's the, the harder one and which one's the finer one so that I can that's my first one and then I use the next one for the final one to be a smoother finish uh, where's my other one yeah, so that's my one with just the single tape on it and that one's got two tapes on it so I know which one I'm using and uh, I've got a whole variety I've got probably about 30 different files I don't use them all but I use certainly a three or four of them when I'm cutting a hole um, and uh, you just find your you just find your method you find your way. And then when you're sort of really getting in there, you're finishing it off, you sort of hold it at an angle. So you're doing it like that to get that V at that angle. But then when you want to widen that that throat there, right there, because usually what tends to happen is, is that you've got the drill, say it's three and a half mil for argument's sake, and then you're coming in at an angle, that little bit there where it comes in can sometimes be a bottleneck. So when you when you just when you're finishing, lift up the the saw and go in the opposite way. It's counterintuitive, but what that's doing is it's just widening that throat there inside. You can't see what's going on, but you can feel it and you get to know it with time and experience, you get to know just lift up the thing and go in the opposite direction, which is a bit counterintuitive, but what that does is as I say is it just widens that just that extra little bit. And you can feel the difference when you test it. You have to test it to see what the draw is like. And then you get to know when you're there. 
you know, you can feel it in the drawer when you know you've done it. I haven't tested it yet because I'm not at that stage. I know that I'm not yet there. It just comes with experience. You just need to do them. Lenses, uh, lenses, um, stems were always a, a thing which I didn't like doing until I cracked it kind of thing. You have to just, you just got to do it. You got to put in the time. You just got to put in the time. I've got a bit of a clogging going on here. Almost there. Anyway, as usual, I've been droning on for too long. Happy Monday, folks. Catch you on the next one.